Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationships. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships, How can relationships evolve, evolve with people evolve as they grow and change? Grow and change. So like a, a really thick brow we might actually want to keep, but make sure you get the mustache off, this kind of stuff. So they're like, what to my eyes look like obviously subjective aesthetic judgments, but they're being presented in the medical literature as medical fact. Welcome to the Curious Folks podcast. For those challenging the status quo in love, sex, and relationships, my name is Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Misla. And today on our ongoing exploration of the impact of conditioning on our perception of beauty and sexual self-esteem, we're talking with Professor Rebecca Herzik about the history of hair removal. So the other day, I am home and my daughter emerges post bath, which is an experience. She does like a bath. It's followed by like a skincare routine. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's like eucalyptics involved. Like there's this whole thing that she does. <laughs> does she then do zoomies around the house? <laughs> and that's what my dog does. <laughs> that's so funny. She emerges from the bathroom and announces to me, or just not even announces, but informs me that she is shaving her legs. Boo! She is 10. I should have known. Now, we are, you can imagine, a very body positive household, right? Mm -hmm. So I am often unshaven and she has seen my body. We, we don't talk about being skinny. We talk about being healthy. Instead of talking about being beautiful, we talk about being comfortable. So it's, there's not a place or space in which I am putting these regulations on around what beautiful is. But she is certainly picking them up. She, she asked me not too long ago about the hair on her toes, whether that was normal. And I was like, yes, everybody does. And I showed her mine. And she had asked me about shaving her legs before. And I was like, eh, it's going to require a conversation. There's a lot of decisions to be made. Want to make sure you're doing it safe. I don't know if you're ready. But apparently she decided that she was ready. And mm -hmm. I, in that moment, I had to think, I was like, okay, how am I going to react to this? I don't want to punish her for doing something that is about her body. But also that doesn't feel okay. She's that 10. Is. I know. I do feel sad about this. I have questions, though. One, do you shave your legs? Yes. Not mm. often. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I can see it's hard, right? Right. I'm role modeling it. Of course. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. No, I, that I understand. I, to me, it was more about, it wasn't that she was never going to do it. I just mm. wish that the conditioning didn't impact her so young. Like, I don't remember. Mm. Maybe I was 10 when I wanted to do it. I don't know. Well, okay. Actually, I'm going to step back. You know what? Now that upon reflection, I was, I think I was 10 years old. I was 10 or 11 years old because I remember the first time that I shaved was before my first day of middle school. Wow. So that was sixth grade. So that was about 11 years old. And I remember having the conversation with my parents. Well, actually, my parents had signed me up for summer school at the middle school the summer before the school year mm -hmm. started. And they told me about it the day before. And so, of course, I was horrified because this is a big deal now going into middle school. I have to choose the outfit, all the things. And so I told them because they had not told me they needed to give me permission to shave, that that was the deal that we were making. I wouldn't be as mad as I should be if they let me shave. And they said, OK. So I went to the bathroom and my father had those like old school razors that like you twisted it and put the blade mm -hmm. in and then twisted it and it like closed and so I started to shave with that, never had shaved before. And in the process, the razor went sideways as I was shaving like my from my knee up. And I essentially slit from my knee to my groin, to my thigh, that the entire oh. length of my thigh, I just cut open to the, you could see the white. Like I cut Whoa. deep into the skin where it was like white. There's like major arteries going there. I know. And so I look at it and it hurts. And then immediately whoosh, blood just yes. starts like pouring out of my leg. So then I'm freaking out. My dad comes in. So I'm in the shower now, half shaven, cut and bleeding. My dad comes in and I'm like, uh, and he just goes and like grabs me, like pulls me out, like takes me to lay down. 
down. I'm like, oh, so I'm getting ready for middle school. I'm naked. My dad has a holding me. I'm bleeding. Like, it's too many things. It's too many things happening right now. And so I had this big scar that has, you know, since gone away. But I had this big scar that existed. And I had one shaven leg then and one non-shaven leg. (laughs) (laughs) It was a whole mess. And so, yeah, I had this big old scar from the first time that I tried to shave and like and be grown up. And so certainly I was traumatized by that and was concerned that that would happen to my daughter. But she had, she apparently did a much better <laughs> job. <laughs> she hasn't cut herself bleeding. Yeah, good for her. Uh, for not... Um... For not maiming herself, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> For not permanently scarring herself. Good job. Absolutely. But, you know, I'm sad. I have a big sad face for her because, yeah, exactly. Like, she's too early. 10 for you, too early as well. Too early as well. Yeah. yeah. I have never put a razor to my skin. So I've never shaved wow. ever. Um, sure I know, I'm right? Gone. Crazy. A well, uh, couple of reasons. One, sort of the, the mild reason is because I'm just not very hairy. I've won the genetic lottery. My mom and dad aren't hairy. I'm not very hairy. I get a few hairs that I can either pluck or, you know, like just manage myself. Mm -hmm. I never really need to shave. Mm -hmm. That's one reason. The other reason is when I was little, younger than 10, because I was still living at home, the hair removal piece I learned from my mom, uh, which I'm sure most women do, most girls do. She would sit in the living room and use sugaring so like melted sugar so what we would eat is caramel essentially delicious to Mm. remove her hairs remove hair from her legs that she only had a few hairs as well so she would do it herself and she would make a bowl this like sugaring bowl and then she would put both of her thumbs on it and she would push this bowl down her shins and make a thin layer and then she would hold one hand of it and whip it off and she would then make another bowl she would move to the next patch push it down Mm. her skin pull it off and then she, that's what she would do and she'd do it really quickly and it just it didn't seem painful you know and she would do it kind of regularly and it just was part of her taking care of regime thing so I would ask her like what are you doing she's like yeah. hair ruin my hair and then when you're ready like I'll show you how to do it and all that kind of stuff and then I was like well I don't know like people shave at, at some point I knew that you could also shave and I wasn't really sure why she was doing this thing so we're having one of those conversations and my dad happens to be around that also gives you an insight to, to our household. She takes my hand and rubs my hand on my dad's stubble, right? And she says, mm-hmm. if you shave your legs, your legs will be like your dad's stubble. It's coarse and it's like, you know, it doesn't feel very nice, right? So my dad hadn't shaved probably for a couple of days. And I knew he shaves, right? Because I see him in the morning. And that was her reasoning. She was like, if you ever shave anywhere in your body, it'll be mm-hmm. like your dad's stubble. Mm-hmm. so I was horrified I was absolutely <laughs> horrified that any part of my body was like my, my dad's stubble so I was like never mm-hmm. shaving anything 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 and then eventually when I did have the few hairs that I do now I learned the sugaring bowl trick and that's how I take care of my hair wow yeah if you all have interesting stories about where you learned about or started removing hair from any part of your body, please call in, write in, send voice memos, because I imagine there's just a collection of stories around what we understood about our hair. You and I, for Patreon, did podcast after hours. Oh my God. That was <laughs> where so we funny. talk a little bit more freely and candidly, and we talked mm-hmm. about all of our kind of nether hair, if you will. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. the hair around our vulvas and what we learned and and how we each saw that and how I shampooed and conditioned mine (laughs) for a very long time as a younger person because I didn't know, no one taught me what to do with the hair. So I did what I did in my head. So if you're a Patreon member, you should go in and listen to the whole story because it is fantastic and hilarious. All of these stories show us that in our lifetime with our families, there's conditioning around what hair removal is and what hair is appropriate. And in our conversation with Dr. Herzik, she illuminated where the origins of our current understanding about what is appropriate with hair comes from. And it was both fascinating and horrifying. Horrifying. <laughs> That's my description Horrifying. Of it. Some of the stuff was so horrifying. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca Herzig. I'm a writer and a teacher based in Maine, and I'm also currently a visiting scholar at the Center for Science and Justice in California. So excited to have you on. I read your book last year and 
changed the way that I saw things. I think I understood that every decision that I've made has been constructed over time in history and capitalism for me to make that particular decision. But really understanding the roots of the history of that was fascinating. On this show, we have explored the history of things like Valentine's Day and some of the holidays and always going through the history helps to illuminate how we have autonomy and choice to go down that path or make a different decision. And so I'm hoping we can just start with you giving us an abridged history of hair removal so that we can all start with the same context of understanding how we got to the place that we are right now. So really a bridge. The book kind of, you know, tries to drag this out over three or four hundred pages, but really a bridge. If you go back in what we might call U.S. history, obviously even what we call the place we're all sitting on is a little bit contested. But if you if we go back in U.S. history until say about 1830, it was not common among uh, white Americans to remove hair. Whether they identified as men, whether they identified as women, it just wasn't a standard normalized thing. In fact, at that time and for the couple of hundred years preceding that, European settlers in, again, what's now called the United States, would have thought that removing hair was one of those strange things, that was their word, that the people they called the Indians did. All the indigenous peoples of the Americas, who they all, again, white settlers kind of lumped together under this one word, Indian. And they wrote among themselves a lot, a lot, a lot about these strange practices that the Indians did of seeming to pluck out or singe out or scrape off every single hair on their body. Then they would debate whether, oh, well, actually, are they removing all their hair or were they just naturally less physically hairy than the Europeans? And there was enormous debate about this. And from all kinds of people we still consider famous. Thomas Jefferson wrote about this. Alexander Humboldt wrote about this. Lewis and Clark on their journeys across the continent wrote about this. But if you fast forward just a hundred years, it then had become completely normalized for all kinds of people, especially people identified as women, to regularly, every single day, remove hair from some part of their bodies, usually their face, but increasingly by say 1930, Women and girls were removing hair from their armpits, and some of them were starting to remove it from their legs, and so on. And so I got interested in how, in just a hundred years, norms completely flipped upside down. So the idea that no, only those strange other native people would do this practice to only strange foreign, maybe immigrant people wouldn't do this practice. If you want to be like us, if you want to be, quote, civilized, if you want to be, quote, white, if you want to be, quote, American, of course, you would take off all the visible hair in your body. And to me, it's not just interesting because it makes this kind of 180 degree shift, but that everybody got on board with something that takes so much time, (laughs) so much daily labor, so much money, if you just think about like how yes. much it costs to buy razors or waxes or depilatories or whatever it is. And, you know, for anybody who's ever done it, a not trivial amount of pain, you know, blood, <laughs> this is like discomfort, sometimes downright pain, depending on where you're removing the hair or who's removing the hair from you and that sort of thing. So that's the part I got interested in and what the story I was trying to tell in the book. Can you talk a little bit more about where you saw that shift as it relates to, to your point, the indigenous communities and looking at that and saying, actually, that feels like that is not dignified to show up that way to that reversal. And in reading your book, it sounds like each non-white population that the white explorers got introduced to, at some point, something was determined about them based on their hair. Absolutely. So things start changing, I argue in the book, in the early 19th century as more and more of those European settlers start moving into cities. And as they do, they're moving away from their like kin communities and their historical practices, the things they might have learned from their in their own households, from, from their own relatives, and starting to have to learn how to be a person from people who might be strangers. So they're learning more and more from newspapers, Magazines are getting published at this time, and people are starting to kind of read about what what norms of body care might be. So the changes are starting to happen slowly, partly just through different patterns of living for European settlers. But I think the real change to your question takes on a little bit later in the 19th century with the rise of Darwinian theories of evolution. Because as people start adopting and disseminating the idea that human beings weren't maybe 
created by God and in specific ways for specific purposes, but might have evolved from other animals. The idea of anything that associated human beings with animals became sort of more and more repugnant for, again, mostly white European settlers. According to Thomas Jefferson, who wrote about indigenous people, he thought that the reason they were removing their hair is that it was too animal to have visible body hair. Um, And this is in notes on the state of Virginia. I looked and looked and looked for records written by indigenous people in their own voices in, say, the 18th or 19th century about what they thought about it and had trouble finding it. It's all filtered through European kind of publishers and so on. But by the late 19th century, there is more and more kind of popular writing in the United States about being connected to apes and not wanting to be connected to apes. And I'm suggesting that hair removal and all of the kind of medicalization of hair removal that came on in that late 19th century period is connected in some ways to those ideas, those new ideas. And with that, all the kind of xenophobic and white supremacist ideas about racial hierarchies and national hierarchies and gendered hierarchies and how specific people might be arrayed along those hierarchies and marked in particular ways by their bodies. Yeah, that we had a conversation recently where the guest was talking about the paper bag test and the comb test. So the paper bag test being that one would put a paper bag next to someone's skin. And if you were darker than that, that that would deny you entry. And similarly, if you could not put a comb through your hair, that that was an indication that you were different, right? So if you had straight hair, that comb would go freely. If you had curly or coiled hair, then that that comb would get stuck. And so, you know, naming that as continued examples throughout history of this obsession with and leveraging hair as hierarchy, to your point. Yeah. And even what I'm hearing is not even hierarchy, but humanity is what I'm hearing you say. Yes, absolutely. It's a really important kind of distinction. And the the debate that, again, this is all, I wrote the book from like asking questions about the, the dominant class, white, educated, mostly Eastern seaboard based men. So I, the perspective is very much from that sort of slanted point of view, you could say. But yeah, they were obsessed with these rankings. And the rankings, as you said, were not simply about social status, but were about entry into the category of humanity. And the reason that all these 18th and early 19th century white writers were obsessed with the Indians, as I show in the book, was because they saw the kind of physical appearance of the body as linked to their possible capacities for self-governance. Really. So the question was, should these native peoples be allowed by the white colonizers to govern themselves? They asked that question by thinking, well, then we have to know what kind of, this is their language, not mine, creatures they are. Are they governed by caprice, by whimsy, by irrationality, or are they are they capable of the sort of prudence and judgment that it requires to be a self-governing kind of person? And all kinds of European observers weighed in on this question. And one of the fascinating tables I found in my research was by the the great naturalist Linnaeus, which is a name that people learn in middle school when you're learning scientific classifications, right? That genus species thing, that's all Linnaean nomenclature. And he made an actual table that had ranks of people, what we would call racial ranks of people, listed both according to their capacities for self-governance, like can they do it or can they not on a scale, right next to their hair type. Is it curly? Is it straight? Is it, you know, all this sort of stuff. So explicitly linked by the leading authorities of the day were these ideas about citizenship and governance and all those things. And um, what we would think of as just physical features in one way or another, they tied those two things together. As I listen to you, what I'm noticing, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there seems to be this social, cultural cognitive dissonance of first kind of looking at the the native folks as oh they're removing their hab so that they're they're not sort of close to apes to then deciding that it's, that's what they're doing and not really asking them or, or or taking any record of it but assuming that's what's happening then we kind of adopting it the white europeans are adopting it and then looking back at the natives saying but you are closer to apes so you're not you can't govern yourself there seems to be this like weird cognitive dissonance even though we've decided to remove hair because what we think they were doing i absolutely hear what you're asking i think one of the things that happens is that the kind of the normalization of hairlessness among whites in the us starts mm-hmm. after a lot of the indian wars have ended 
So mm-hmm. after whites have successfully forcibly removed genocidally displaced most of the indigenous populations to mm-hmm. reservation lands have to confinement essentially then they can start valorizing hairlessness as a mark mm-hmm. of civility and mm-hmm. hygiene and all of those kinds of things so mm-hmm. it kind of happens sequentially at that point those same white authorities start judging new immigrants to the United States. So new people arriving from Eastern and Southern Europe who tend to be physiologically more visibly hairy with thicker, darker hair Mm -hmm. as lesser than because they're more visibly hairy than the the native born U.S. whites who are already there. And you start seeing in medical literatures in the late 19th and early 20th century, new taxonomies. So replacing the Linnaean one, but new taxonomies, super intense gradations of like how hairy the Celts are, how hairy the Greeks are, how hairy the Italians are, how hairy the Jews, who they all call us one people are, this sort of thing. And then showing what normal hair distribution patterns are in these various types of people by men and by women, and how you can sort of grade them according to these hairy types. But at that point, too much hairiness you didn't want. You get the development of new medical terms like hirsutism or hypertrichosis that literally didn't exist before the late 19th century, Mm -hmm. as they start naming some kinds of hairiness, a disease or a pathology that is typically found, they said, in certain types of people, racial or ethnic groups, we would call. So there's definitely a link between race and hair, amount of hair, distribution of hair, that is very well documented and almost used as a classification from the beginning and also a whole bunch of pathology that came from it as well. So it became a real signal to identity and race and where you rank in the world and and such an important part of how you fit into the society. So that's super interesting. And I, I don't think this is why Jacqueline was like, when she read your book, I was like, we have to talk about this because I've never heard it spoken in this kind of way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's all of those things. And one of the things that shocked me as a researcher, because I came at this as a historian of, of race and science and technology, that was sort of what I specialized in in graduate school and what my first couple of books were about. Researching one of those earlier books, I was in the anthropology library at Harvard, which is a giant like compendium of books for the last hundreds of years of people studying human difference and what makes it and all this kind of stuff. And I was surprised given what I had learned about the history of both of race as a social category, but also of racial science, like how scientists had studied human difference and what kind of claims they had made about it. I had assumed, especially somebody raised in the U.S., that skin color had always kind of been the dominant marker, right? In the same way that we use it casually now, people are black or brown or white or this sort of thing. In the 19th century, for sure, at least according to all the racial anthropology sitting there in the library, hair was much more on the forefront of people's minds. And again, like all the leading naturalists of the time, Humboldt, Linnaeus a bit earlier, all this sort of stuff, they're all talking about body hair. And I found that fascinating. The first big survey kind of studied by historians of statistics now is one of the first big statistical compendiums collected in the US. It was a big study of um, volunteers in the Union Army during the Civil War. The guy went out and tracked how much body hair the soldiers had and made these big tables and um, would hide, uh, have somebody hide in the bushes. And so could look at soldiers bathing so he could see where the hair growth was on, you know, the parts of the body that were usually clothed and then wrote about this in a statistical compendium. And again, people reading at the time must have thought that was typical enough, the sort of fascination with hair that they didn't think it was odd that a U.S. Army researcher was hiding in the bushes watching people bathe and writing down what they saw. You know, now this would raise questions, but at the time, of course, you'd want to know about their hair growth and distribution. Of course, you would make then racial tables based on that and put them in your study, which are are there now if you go look at it. It's fascinating. And I I also imagine that this also applies to, to gender. How is that then translated into gender and what's okay for women? What's okay for men? You know, beards and mustaches versus not. How is that then sort of decided? It was always twined together. So it was always racialized, gendered and gendered ideas about race. They're always kind of inseparable in that way. In the medical literature where you can see these things laid out most clearly, Doctors who see patients are making kind of tables of what's normal and what's pathological 
primarily with an interest towards their their women identified patients because those are the people who are coming to them saying doctor doctor i have this thing can you help me with it i have this issue that i don't like can you help me with it and they're making tables for no- one another but they're saying things like this is normal in a woman of this basically racial type this is abnormal in a woman of this racial type this is what standard and then they're debating with one another no 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 this is normal in that racial type no i think that's abnormal in that racial type and they they add often another category of this is beautiful. So like a a really thick brow, we might actually want to keep, but make sure you get the mustache off, this kind of stuff. So they're like, what to my eyes look like, obviously subjective aesthetic judgments, but they're being presented in the medical literature as medical fact, you know, as like, this is obvious that this is where the line between the normal and the pathological should be. And I got interested then in how hair, its appearance, its removal, all the practices we have around it becomes really early on one of the key features that late 19th century scientists, physicians, naturalists are using to make binary sexual categories at all. And we tend to think about, us historians who care about these kinds of things, tend to think about how those binary sexual classifications came about as primarily through studies of either the genitals, what became a normal penis or normal vagina and so on, normal clitoris, or hormones later in the 20th century, what became considered standard amounts of estrogen or standard amounts of testosterone and so on. But I'm seeing a lot earlier in the 19th century, all kinds of work to try to like force what is obviously a continuous category, how much hair is on a body into these binary piles. And that took a lot of work, took a lot of debate among the physicians themselves, and then a lot of pushback or adoption by patients into like, yes, I want to fall into this binary category, so I'm going to have you remove my hair through whatever technologies you have available to you, or I'm not going to follow what you're telling me to, and I'm going to push back and allow my beard to grow, my mustache to grow, whatever, despite what you're telling me about binary categories in that way. I would love to actually go back to you saying, you know, help remove my hair and whatever technologies are available at the moment, because in your book, you really highlight all of the different ways in which we were removing hair and sometimes at the risk of everything from a skin rash to death based on whatever you were using. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, about all of the ways and creative ways in which we have removed hair over time as our technology has developed. Oh, that's great. Um, I'll start by telling a little story. So I I started this project actually as a graduate student when I was sitting around with a bunch of other graduate students, and we were we were joking about papers we might write for for the end of the term. And one of the students kind of dared me to write about this thing she had received as a holiday gift one year called an epilady, which almost nobody I know now has heard of, but a lot of us of a certain age remember that it was this handheld device that just had metal coils on the end and you plug it into the wall and you turn it on and the coils rotate and vibrate. And the idea is you're supposed to hold it up to the hair on your body. The coils catch the hair (laughs) because they're moving around, yank the hair out. And the company that started this sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of these things over the holiday season where they were first promoted when this cohort member in my graduate school got one, but then it collapsed right away when people realized this was not going to (laughs) work. It's just way too painful. Um, And nobody wanted to buy things again. So they dared me to write a final term paper about the history of this thing. I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm up for that dare. So I trot over to the library and I start trying to research this short-lived technology. And as I was doing it in an old business magazine, I found just a half a phrase reference to people removing x-rays to remove hair. And I was like, wait, no, that can't be. And I I started kind of digging into that. It took me forever to find things, but that was what opened up this whole world to me. It turned out that using x-rays to remove hair was not a fringe phenomenon, but for 50 years in the US and all over the place, all over the US territories, all over North America, There would be salons, as far as I can tell, as kind of common as nail salons are now, where people would offer prolonged exposure to X radiation in order to remove your hair for essentially cosmetic purposes. So people would hold these things up to their face or their armpits, their legs, in some cases, their genitals. And just as with anybody who's gone through radiation treatment might know, like that will make your hair fall out, right? And give you cancer at the same time. 
Absolutely. And people had horrible cancers because they've been holding like an x-ray up to their face, you know, for week after week, they go once a week, you know, for 20 minutes or so. just horrible cancers. The people who were researching this decades later named this North American Hiroshima maiden syndrome after the survivors of the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But I don't know about you all. I had never heard that story at all, even though I considered myself a kind of historian of of these things, never heard about it. And so that got me interested in all the rest of the ways that people have done this over the years. And it turns out there are a lot. I could <laughs> list more if you're interested. So, As you were describing things in the book around even the, the things that have gone from organic and natural concoctions to then leveraging the the tools that were used to strip fur off of animals and the production of meat and looking at that and saying, huh, if it worked for this this cow, it could work for a woman too. And then like marketing and selling that, it really made me pause and say, like, wait, what is in there? And like, what is in some of these other things that we have been using to strip our hair over time? Not thinking about and making the connection between, oh, they may not actually be that safe. <laughs> like, yes. They may not actually be something that we want on our bodies. And so that was a moment of pause for me where, where I was reading that and thinking, over time, again, just all of the the ways in which not only have we been creative, but we have been willing to harm our bodies over time in the name of beauty, in the name of fitting in, in the name of status. The way in which we look on the outside has been our focus and we've done so much harm as a result. I just... Yeah, it continues to, to be something that I sit with even now. And I'm wondering for you, has that impacted the way that you've thought about hair removal or the folks in your life or your students as they've been reading it and they come to you and say, I'm never going to shave again. <laughs> it absolutely has because it's both the things that we're putting on or in ourselves and the consequences of that. And, you know, as I point out in the book, a lot of these have been not just painful, but downright lethal. You know, there were depilatories that had thallium acetate in them that killed a whole bunch of people who used them, you know, and laser therapy, very painful, has burned people disproportionately with darker skin because they're often designed in standards for people with paler skin. So, you know, there's, there's a whole not great history about all this. The part that I, I was trying to tell in the book that I, I hadn't seen in a lot of histories of beauties I'd seen before is then what the larger both ecological and labor ramifications of all of that are too. So like, you know, where are the waxes that people might use to wax their legs or their eyebrows or their genitals or whatever, where are those coming from? Well, it turns out, you know, <laughs> all the same kind of planet destroying global productive processes that we're concerned about in a lot of environmental stuff, but we never quite bring all the way down into our personal care practices or that sort of thing. So there's a, a growing movement of younger people who are asking great questions about this and more and more trying to make their own personal care, beauty items and things like that. What I come to at the end of the book is, yeah, but for all of us living in this transnational capitalist society, we don't get outside of all of those flows just because we might make our own beauty products at home, right? We still buy those things from somewhere and they're coming from somewhere. So even if you buy palm wax on the internet and then make your own things at home. Yeah. Where'd that come from? You know, it deforested something in order to grow Carnaba palm trees for export to, you know, wherever people are purchasing them now. So I come away from it that it it's extremely consequential to think about what you're doing. That's kind of the big point <laughs> always in my teaching and my writing is we just need to think about what we're doing. It's as simple as that. But I also, I don't, harbor any illusions that we can ever be free of this stuff just because we think about it. So I might not shave my armpits anymore, but where is my clothing coming from? Where is my food coming from? Where are my medicines coming from? You know, all that sort of stuff. I don't get out of it all just by going hairy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to bring in the, the sort of the third factor in the way that we think about people, which is age. I think we, hair also correlates to age as well. The rhetoric is that as you grow older, you become more hairy, especially in your face for women. And, and then on the other side as well, things like full Brazilian waxes, right? Like being so hairless that you are, you know, closer to a younger girl has so many connotations and it can get to the really, really dark places. Can you speak to that at all? Is that, is that a part of the, the way that hair is treated? 
Absolutely. It's both a huge part of the way hair is treated now. And I'll, and I'll bet your listeners have ideas about this. Like who was the first person who introduced them to hair removal and how, what was that relationship like? I learned through the research, just from the letters that I could find in archives, that often it was mothers who were bringing daughters in to either hair removal salons or to doctors to ask about things. So there's an intergenerational thing that's very important around hair and what we do with it. There's that classic thing of a a father perhaps teaching a son how to shave for the first time. You know, there's so much stuff about age and generational transmission and knowledge and things. One of the things that surprised me was even in the medical literature in the 19th century, so circling back to something we were talking about with the racial and gendered categories, the doctors were really explicit that these were also age-based categories. And one of the doctors I found said, you know, we're just not even talking about women over 45 because the doctor was very frank in the writing. Nobody really cares what they look like anymore. So we're really talking about women between and girls between 15 and 45 when that is when their charms are of most, you know, concern or whatever. So they were explicitly interested in the appearance of women and girls of reproductive age, essentially. And they didn't shy away from saying that. Obviously, people had their own ideas about this and would reach out to doctors or would do their own practices, you know, despite whatever the doctors were saying. But certainly age from way back has been a part of what gets considered normal and what gets considered pathological and what gets considered ideal and what gets considered acceptable. I want to go back to the gender piece again. I'm curious how... Please. Men once again got away with it, right? So if we've decided that we want to remove her because we don't, we want to prove that we're not, you know, we're not apes, we want to get as far from the idea of an ape as possible. And then somehow along the way, men were like, ah, it's okay, we look like apes, but women could just never be ever even considered anywhere near being an ape or, or an, it just become much more of a severe thing for them. At what point we've kind of said, oh, it's okay. It's not really about, I mean, is it about sort of industrialization and capitalism? Is that what kind of put the onus onto women and and let men get away with it? Or what was the thing that made the gender split? It's a great question. And I'm going to give a sort of wonky answer because I'm going to skip around time periods a lot. So at this period of um, when, when Darwin's kind of ideas were seeping into popular culture, I think it was widely understood that the females, this would have been their language, females were closer inevitably to apes because they were the birthing ones. They were inherently kind of like closer. This varied and people made all kinds of complicated backbends and whatever around racial categories of femaleness and would make completely racist white supremacist ideas about this, where sometimes white females were posed as the most civilized and the ones that white men needed to look up to in order to become civilized and domesticated properly and all this kind of stuff. So there was a lot of sort of mixture around this. But my sense reading the medical literature was that the idea was females were were always going to be more primal because they're the birthing ones, right? And they, so we want to like remove hair on them to make sure that they look their proper human civilized, you know, non-mustached self in that way. That's so oh, fascinating. Wow. It remains pretty static until fashion trends start changing in the early 20th century and more and more of the body starts becoming revealed. But if you think about it, mostly for people who are identified as women. So first the kind of shorter sleeves on the kind of new woman or flapper look, and then eventually hemlines start going up for women. Men aren't really showing leg or arm in the same way in popular fashion. This varies across classes and races, of course, too. But if you're thinking about that sort of dominant image in popular magazines and stuff, it varies by gender in that way. So there's just more skin visible on a woman for things to get normalized or idealized in that way. Moving forward into the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, my sense is that it, even as I was reading the book, I said, it just hasn't caught up with men yet, but it will. Consumer culture, essentially. Women were the primary consumers in most US households. So they are the ones who personal care industries, beauty industries were targeting for consumption. And it made sense to me that, you know, eventually they're going to figure out that they've tapped that market and they need to move on. And that is precisely what happened starting in the late 90s, early 2000s where large companies, as a very explicit marketing strategy in a lot of cases, realized they needed to move into targeting older women 
who remember they said, you know, over 45, we're not going to worry about them. They realized there's this giant untapped market. So yes, we do need to promote ideas of hygiene, beauty, personal care, obligatory care, all this stuff to older women. They started targeting even younger women. So now 11, 12, 13s, instead of just 15, 16, 17s. And they started targeting people identified as men. And you can start seeing the growth of ads, like concerned about too much hair on the chest or too much hair on the back. Women started being encouraged to bring their boyfriends or husbands in for hair removal treatment of various kinds. And it's absolutely exploded. Like the growth in men's beauty, personal care, products has totally grown over the last 15, 20 years. I'm very interested to see, you can find on social media and stuff like men starting to push back on that saying, no, I'm not going to wax my chest. (laughs) It's painful and it itches and I'm not going to do it every month, you know, but so there's pushback on it, just like there always has been from other people who've been kind of pushed to remove hair. But yeah, so it was only a matter of time, essentially, before markets realized they were missing a market and then they got it. Yeah. I just want to go back to, to what you shared, because that as soon as you said women are seen as more primal because we are the ones who give birth and that is why we need to regulate more. It just like opened 12 more, like made so many connections around the way that we dress, the way that we act, the way that if that is the guiding belief, no wonder there are so many restrictions on limiting how we show up and who we are, because it is, it is for the greater good of not allowing us to fall into our natural beastness and primal state. I don't know if I've ever made that connection before. And I think that that's incredibly powerful and sad. Absolutely. No, I'm right with you. And it's always in U.S. culture, always racialized. And it's always a part of the colonial story about who has a right to be civilized, essentially, And with that, the rights that we think of as attending participation in U.S. society, right? They haven't always been granted to everybody, as we know. And that kind of demarcation between the citizen and the non-citizen has often been linked to the demarcation between the human and the not quite human. And that Mm -hmm. kind of what's going to make you more human has always been racialized, gendered, age-based, right? Children are Mm -hmm. still not seen as entirely human enough to be citizens. Mm -hmm. My child pushes back on me about (laughs) this a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, all those things have always been kind of tied together. And I, one of the things that I just find fascinating is body hair is one of the places where we work all this stuff out as a culture, where all that complexity, all that violence, all that hope, gets put together. So people trying to make themselves one way or another, hair is really malleable and you can try to make yourself look quote unquote more feminine or quote unquote younger or quote unquote wider, right? With these x-ray people, I mentioned the x-ray earlier, it was really clear in the ads that they were trying to push mostly young inner city immigrant women who probably had really rough lives, if you think about it, in the early 20th century, they were they were trying to suggest to them, if you do this, if you whiten, lighten your skin through this new scientific modern technology, you will have access that has been denied to you. And they were extremely explicit in the ads that that access meant material comfort. It meant um, essentially white privilege in all kinds of ways. And you could get that by x-raying your skin right and and a lot of a lot of people went for it it must have looked extremely appealing in the circumstances they were in it's both right it's like removing hair from sort of eyebrows down while enhancing hair from eyebrows up right because <laughs> there's also that yes. i mean yes hair removal and, it, and then the other side wanting to be as close to blonde as possible, the hair bleaching, the your reverse happens on you know above the eyebrow, where there's also an entire industry, billions, trillions of dollars spent in enhancing the hair above our eyebrows and our and our eyebrows, and then removing the hair below. Kind of crazy because I think you're right, hair is malleable, it's visible. It really can add change someone's appearance and is signal to all these things. It's fascinating. And again, as a historian, I'm just mesmerized that if you read the European colonizers, travelers, you know, missionaries accounts from the even the early 19th century and, and the 18th century, all of the things that we do now, the shaving, the plucking, the sugaring, the waxing, the threat, you know, all those things, they're seeing the indigenous people do and they're narrating as what makes them so weird. 
what makes them so strange, what makes them so other. And now, again, most Americans, not all of them, but definitely most, like we're talking like 90, 96% of Americans are removing their hair in some way, in a super regular way, as just taken for granted, standard, you know, of course we do this. It's strange if you don't. It may be unhygienic if you don't. It's certainly not attractive, if, you know, all this kind of stuff. So we got from one end to the other in a remarkably short period of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that, again, that was one of the biggest takeaways from from the book was this myth about personal choice and individualism and the unrecognized impact of conditioning. I would want to talk about this for hours longer. (laughs) There's just so much more. And we want to be respectful of your time. And we want to spend just a few minutes getting to know you a little bit better. And so if you're comfortable, there are four rapid fire questions that we would love to ask you to end our conversation. I would be happy to. Okay. So the first is, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self about love, sex, or relationships? Oh, uh, I love this question because it's so hard, I think. I actually lately, for reasons that I'm not going to bore you with, have been trying to put a lot of work into just loving my younger self instead of like Mm -hmm. telling her, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda, just saying like, hey, you did the best you could with what you knew at the time. So I wish she'd just trusted her gut more. So if I were talking to younger people now, I might say, go ahead and trust Mm -hmm. your gut, listen to it and act on it. But when I think about my younger self, I mostly just try to say, yeah, you know, you did what you could. (laughs) Try to be gentle. You're here. Yeah, that's a good practice period for sure. Okay, what is one romantic or sexual adventure on your bucket list? This also might sound strange, but I've actually I've actually done all the things on my romance or sexual bucket list, good for you. which means I I probably need some people to give me some new ideas. <laughs> so um, yeah, but I no, I actually I actually went after all those things. So that's fantastic. Really nice. Love that answer. Yeah. <laughs> How do you challenge the status quo? Oh, honestly, the status quo, partly, I guess, because of what I study and what I think about, always looks really fragile and precarious to me, Mm -hmm. less less settled than we tend to think it is. Mm -hmm. So I like to remind myself of that. I like to remind other people of that, that like things haven't always been this way and they Mm -hmm. definitely won't always be this way. And as soon as you Mm -hmm. open up that kind of space, you can imagine all kinds of other ways you'd rather it was. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And that that I think is the essential step that we need is the ability to imagine life looking differently. And once you realize that the way it looks now is, you know, definitely not that old and took a lot of work to put together Mm -hmm. this way, you realize Mm -hmm. it it could be done very, very differently Mm -hmm. if we wanted to. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I find the status quo, the challenge status quo, it barely takes a couple of questions. It's actually yes. a lot simpler. Yes. It, it really just takes a couple of questions and then it crumbles in your, in your hand in front of your eyes. And then you can, you can see what's on the other side. Oh, that's a beautiful way to say it. I couldn't agree more. And I see that nowhere so much as as a teacher. It's remarkable in a classroom how quickly people just fall into a habit or a norm. So you can change things just by going in and moving the desks or by asking people to stand up, you know, instead of sit down mm-hmm. or by inviting them to tell a joke in the classroom, you already sort of puncture what everybody is expecting. And then all kinds of new things become possible. I I love the idea. It does. It can crumble with remarkable speed if you, if you give it a chance. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Last, but definitely not least, we are a curious bunch and we are curious. What are you curious about lately? I remain really curious about how small things are tied to big things how even the most seemingly vast systems or processes are actually made up of a lot of little tiny actions, habits, statements, practices, whatever, and how those two things fit together. I tried to get at that in the book, how we hold up these big, big transnational systems with these little tiny decisions that we don't think about when we're in the shower or at the Mm. sink. And that's the part that fascinates me, I think, that I remain curious about all over the place, how the small things I'm doing get tied to bigger things, how the big things I'm interested in, war, inequity, whatever they are, are tied to the small things I'm doing. Totally. Rebecca, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts. This has been a super interesting conversation. As always, we can we can carry on this conversation for at least another hour easily. And we'd love to have you back and talk about all the other amazing things that you're, you're writing about and you're thinking about. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. 
Uh, you're welcome. And thank you both for inviting me to be here. It's been a complete pleasure. And thank you to everyone listening too. Read the book that inspired this conversation, Plucked, A History of Hair Removal. And if you want to take a small step that has a big impact, purchase the book from a local, woman-owned, POC-owned, queer-owned bookstore. And while you're there, check out Professor Rebecca Herzig's other books, The Nature of Difference, Science of Race in the United States, From Jefferson to Genomics, and Suffering for Science, Reason and Sacrifice in the Modern America. To share your thoughts on this conversation or your stories about the first time that you removed your hair, head to Facebook and join our Facebook group. We have a lot of stories coming up in the next few weeks, from conscious uncoupling to insights on dating a sex worker to how to structure a thriving monogamous relationship. And to keep up on the upcoming episodes and to share your curiosities on the topic, first, follow or like this podcast so that we can continue to arrive on your phone each week. And then follow us on Instagram, where we share sneak peeks of coming episodes. And of course, we have a very special place in our hearts for our Patreon members. Deep appreciation for your continued support of this podcast. We can do this because of you. If you want to get behind the scenes footage, mini episodes, and over 50 videos from educator-led workshops, then go to Patreon at We Are Curious Foxes. And then let us know that you're listening by sharing a comment, a story, or question by emailing us or sending us a voice memo at listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. Or you can record a question for the show by calling 201-870-0063. This episode is produced and edited by Nina Pollock, who we could never remove from our lives. Our intro music is composed by Dev Saha. We are so grateful for their work. And we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Can I just celebrate yes, the fact that yes. I got that on, on <laughs> <laughs> Yes! <laughs> okay. Geno with an A, not an O. Genomics. Genomics. Genomic. Genomic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Google. All right. <clears throat> Curious Fox Podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind, and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. 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 Stay curious.